Welcome to Green Tea with D-Man, Antonio Salazar, Episode 1.1, A Brief History of Portugal. Firstly, in order to tell the story of Antonio Salazar and Portuguese politics in the early 20th century, we must go back to the beginning, to the founding of the Kingdom of Portugal, in order to get a complete picture. Just as colonial America set the stage for our current situation here in the United States, the founding of the Kingdom of Portugal sets the stage for the political chaos and turmoil almost eight centuries later when the kingdom fell in the October 5th Revolution. As such, I will only touch on the super important events in Portuguese history until we get closer to the rise of Salazar. With that said, if there isn't already one out there, there should be a podcast series completely dedicated to Portuguese history. It is deep and rich in detail and could provide hundreds of hours of listening enjoyment, and just touching on it does not do justice. However, we are here with a different focus, so there's that. Secondly, let me preface this episode by saying I will almost certainly butcher some of the Portuguese words in this series, and for that, I apologize ahead of time. So, with that covered, let's begin. The Kingdom of Portugal was established on July 25th, 1139, after Prince Afonso Henriquez and his army defeated the Amoravid Moors at the Battle of Urique. Legend has it that as the five Moorish kings were joining against his forces, Afonso had a vision of Christ promising him victory against the Moors. The next day, Afonso's army routed him, and at the conclusion of the battle, the soldiers under his command named Afonso king, and thus began the Kingdom of Portugal. Interesting how close that story resembles the vision Constantine had before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, but since we weren't there for either event, all we can do is ponder. So as most of the fighting was around this time on the Iberian Peninsula, this was part of a larger campaign known as the Reconquista, but more specifically, this fell under the Portuguese Reconquista. Now obviously, just declaring yourself an independent state within a given area doesn't necessarily mean you're a recognized sovereign, and this was the situation for the first four years of the kingdom's existence, as the nearby ruler, Afonso VII of Leon, refused to recognize his cousin, Afonso Henriquez, and the new kingdom. From there, war broke out, but ultimately, thanks to interference by the kingdom of Aragon, the Treaty of Zamora was signed in 1143, giving recognition to the kingdom of Portugal. By 1147, Afonso and his army had managed to take Lisbon from the Moors, but it was not until 1179 that Pope Alexander III finally recognized the Kingdom of Portugal. Now, why does it matter if the Pope recognized Afonso and his kingdom? Well, it meant everything, actually. At this time in European history, if you claimed to be a Christian king, you had little hope of legitimacy unless the Pope and Catholic Church bestowed such legitimacy. This Catholic identity and largely homogenized state would play an important part in Portugal's future, as it allowed an earlier focus on exploration, but it did lead to sharp divisions in the 19th and 20th centuries, when Republicans agitated for a democratic system. Anywho, fighting continued for the next few decades, and then in 1249, with the capture of the Algarve, the Portuguese Reconquista was all but over. Over the next several centuries, Portugal experienced some internal family squabbles, leading to fights over who was legitimate heirs, and also a back-and-forth fight against the Castilians, with interrupted periods of Portuguese armies aiding Castile and Aragon in the Reconquista against the Moors of Granada. Then in 1373, Portugal and England signed an alliance, an alliance which continues to this day, and thus marks the oldest continuous alliance in the world, and it's one which would prove important to Antonio Salazar and his situation during the Second World War. The year 1415 would mark the beginning of European colonialism. But more directly, it was the Portuguese Empire, as on August 21, 1415, a Portuguese army of 45,000 men under the command of King John I and his three sons completely surprised the Marinid Empire's garrison at the city of Ceuta in Morocco. This foothold on the African continent would convince the Portuguese of the necessity to extend their empire and build a lucrative trade network between her colonies and the mainland. By the end of the century, Portuguese explorers had made it to Brazil, India, Congo, East Africa, islands in the Atlantic such as the Azores, and beyond. In 1509, the Portuguese defeated a combined fleet 
from the Ottoman Empire, the Mamluks, Venetians, and Ragusans, thereby solidifying their control over trade in the Indian Ocean. At this point, Portugal was at its peak in the Age of Discovery, and it would be a point in time that Antonio Salazar would refer to when trying to motivate and encourage change within Portuguese society. It was also during this time that Portugal began establishing colonies in areas encompassing modern Brazil, Equatorial Guinea, Angola, Mozambique, Goa and in India, and Timor near Australia. All was well until 1580, when the sun slowly began to set on Portugal, as King Sebastian I died whilst fighting in Morocco against the Saudi. With no dynastic heir, chaos and a civil war ensued, with King Philip II of Spain winning in 1583 and thereby acquiring the Empire of Portugal along with his own Spanish Empire. Now this lasted until the Portuguese War of Restoration in 1640 a low-level conflict that ran for 28 years due to non-Iberian wars which both Spain and Portugal found themselves pulled into, but ultimately, in 1668, King Charles II of Spain agreed to recognize Portuguese independence once again. Due to the personal union with Spain and the ensuing battles against the other naval powers of the Dutch and English, Portugal had lost many of its outposts in the Indian Ocean, Asia, and Africa. At this point, being stretched thin and nearly ruined after years of conflict, the Portuguese decided to focus on Brazil, and after several gold rushes and the discovery of diamonds, hundreds of thousands of Portuguese made their way to Brazil. Now keep in mind, even to this day, Portugal is still a small nation in terms of both land and population. So of course, this constant stream of emigrants prompted a demographic emergency as Portugal's mainland population dwindled under constant emigration to Brazil and the other colonies. And eventually, King John V actually straight up banned emigration in 1709. Now, as if this constant mass emigration wasn't enough of a problem for Portugal, a massive earthquake struck on November 1st, 1755, just southwest of Lisbon. After the earthquake, a tsunami occurred, which struck not only Portugal, but also in North Africa and as far away as Brazil. Between the earthquake, which modern seismologists believe was about a 9.0 on the Richter scale, the tsunami, and the ensuing fires, it is estimated that 85% of the city was completely destroyed, and up to 90,000 of the city's 275,000 people were killed. The carnage was so severe that dead bodies couldn't be buried, and instead they were sent down the river to the mouth of the Tagus. Along with the human cost, many of Portugal's ports in the Atlantic were damaged. Most of Lisbon's churches were leveled, and the Palace of Enrique de Menezes, which stored around 18,000 books in its library, including many official government documents, were completely destroyed. Economists believe that somewhere in the range of 32 to 48 percent of Portugal's GDP was wiped out from this event. It's no surprise, but Portugal would never be the same. In the middle of trying to rebuild from the devastating natural disasters in 1755, Portugal was dragged into the Seven Years' War in 1762 without much of a military to speak of. Sensing that the Portuguese military was incapable of defending its sovereignty and looking to take advantage of British distractions elsewhere, such as Germany and North America, the French and Spanish monarchs decided to make demands that Portugal submit to a Bourbon alliance and thereby declare war on the British Empire. Part of this ultimatum included the stationing of Spanish troops in several Portuguese cities in order to, as the Spanish claimed, liberate and protect Portugal from the British. The ensuing conflict, referred to as the Ghost War, saw the largest mobilization of Spanish forces in the entire 18th century, as roughly 42,000 Franco-Spanish soldiers crossed into Portugal. Although this invasion force was able to capture Almeida, a national uprising and effective mountainous guerrilla campaign managed to cut the Spanish to pieces. By the end of 1762, a British force was able to land in Lisbon, and together with the Portuguese resistance, they inflicted heavy casualties on the Franco-Spanish force, before a truce was finally called for in November. On December 1, 1762, after Portuguese forces launched an incursion into Spanish territory, the truce was signed and hostilities ceased between Portugal and the Franco-Spanish alliance. 
Although the Portuguese nation had rallied in defense of its sovereignty against a superior invasion force, this reliance on British aid would only continue until it eventually boiled over in the early 1800s. Now, the next major conflict was, of course, the Napoleonic Wars. Portugal once again refused French demands to cut off ties and trade with the United Kingdom, and as a result was invaded and occupied in December of 1807. For the next 13 years, the Portuguese capital would reside not in Lisbon, but in Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil. Now, imagine if the U.S. had embarked on a colonial empire, and then decided to move its capital after the British took Washington, D.C. in the War of 1812, and moved it to, let's say, Hawaii. This would have been an episode which mainland Americans most definitely would have been up in arms about if the capital was not brought back to Washington upon the cessation of hostilities. Instead, we kept our capital in D.C., and we weathered the storm. For the Portuguese, though, this did not happen. With their military just a skeleton force, and the monarchy a very far boat trip away in Brazil, the Portuguese armed forces was put under the command of the British, and treaty signed in 1810 gave British goods special pricing and priority transaction in the major Portuguese trade cities of Porto and Lisbon, which ended up wrecking the commerce for its local merchants. With national prestige a shell of its former self, its government ineffectively running the state from a colony thousands of miles away, and its economy decimated, Portugal was ripe for revolution. Therefore, it's no surprise that as soon as Napoleon's forces pulled out of Portugal, a clandestine group called the Supreme Regenerative Council of Portugal and the Algarve was founded by Freemasons and army officers in Lisbon. While the group claimed its main goal was to promote national salvation and independence of the patria, or fatherland, it also had a goal of introducing liberalism into Portuguese politics. Well, unfortunately for this group, three Masons actually routed them out to the authorities in 1817, upon which the Peninsula Regency, overseen by a British military authority, decided to have 12 of the members executed for conspiracy against the monarch. While this event led to protests across Portugal, it was not until 1820, after a liberal outbreak in neighboring Spain, that a full liberal revolution would sweep across Portugal and usher in 14 years of drastic changes to the structure of Portugal and her colonial possessions, as well as political turmoil and, yep, civil war. Beginning on August 24, 1820, a military insurrection began in the northern Portuguese city of Porto. Without encountering any resistance, the revolution spread, and within weeks it had reached Lisbon. Initially, the revolutionaries just demanded the return of the monarchy from Brazil, to its proper place in Lisbon, and also sought to re-establish Portuguese trade dominance in Brazil. For the last five years, Brazil had actually been elevated from colonial status to a kingdom, but the liberal revolution sought to subordinate Brazil as a mere principality under the jurisdiction of the Portuguese mainland's authority. As 1820 turned to 1821, the revolutionaries decided it was time for a constitutional monarchy. Even though the monarchy returned to Portugal in 1821, the revolution continued to churn, and a national election was set up to determine the future of the country. Despite the merchants largely dominating liberalization efforts around 1810 to 1815, it was actually the professional class, such as lawyers, who took up power and wrote the constitution in 1822. Although the Portuguese First Republic was proclaimed in 1910 upon the overthrow of the monarchy, the future Lusitanian Integralists would claim that the monarchy had really been sidelined and given up its own power during the liberalization of the 1820s. And this is something we're going to come back to in probably the next two or three episodes, as the Integralists played an important part in Portuguese politics after the establishment of the First Republic. Anyways, by September of 1822, political events in Portugal had sent shockwaves across the Atlantic, and on September 7th, Brazil formally declared its independence. King John VI's heir, Pedro, was crowned Emperor of Brazil on December 1, 1822. Unfortunately, these events would not settle the question of Portugal's proper governing system, as Prince Miguel, one of John VI's three sons, Emperor Pedro of Brazil being one of the others, was an absolute monarchist and captured the throne in 1826 after the death of his father. 
After attempting to roll back the liberal reforms and re-establish an absolute monarchy as had ruled Portugal before 1822, Miguel encountered resistance from the liberal wing, which would ultimately be led by, guess who, his brother Pedro. Yes, that guy. The liberal Emperor Pedro of Brazil, except he had abdicated the throne for his son, Pedro II, on April 7, 1831. Now sailing to Europe, the liberals had convinced Pedro of the need to correct the situation in Portugal by deposing his usurping brother Miguel and placing the constitutional monarchy of his daughter Maria back into power. After a total of six years of fighting, Miguel just decided to throw in the towel, and he renounced his claims as king in the concession of Avoramante, signed on May 26, 1834. It was expected Pedro would take up the throne under the restored constitutional monarchy until his daughter was of age, but he ended up dying several months after the concession in September 1834, thus passing the monarchy directly back to his 14-year-old daughter, Maria. The next seven decades saw Portugal's economy continue to stagnate. The education system was in shambles, and the monarchy seemed disinterested in governing, leaving it to squabbling political parties to take what they could. This eventually led to the rise of the Portuguese Republican Party, which was founded in 1876. In 1890, Portugal suffered national humiliation at the hands of their old allies, the British, in what is known as the 1890 British Ultimatum. When the Portuguese monarchy bowed to British demands, that Portugal withdrew from Oshonalan, Metebelan, and Shire Nyasa, which is today Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Malawi. In effect, the British were claiming that these lands were British territory, despite Portugal holding claims for it for decades and even hundreds of years in some areas. While this wouldn't be the last straw for the Republicans in Portugal to depose the monarchy, it was one of the main elements which fed into the growing radicalism and popularity of the Republican Party. Now, that last straw actually came 18 years later, when King Carlos, fed up with the constant feuding in the Cortes, or Parliament, and disruption caused by the Republicans, decided to tap João Franco to form a government which was all but a dictatorship. This decision would lead radical Republicans to cross the line in the sand and kick off a sequence of events which would end the Portuguese monarchy once and for all. On February 1st, 1908, Republican activists Alfredo Costa and Manuel Buicha assassinated both King Carlos I and his son, Prince Luis Felipe, as they rode in an open carriage through the Torero de Pazzo, an open square in front of the royal palace, and which today is known as Commerce Square, or Praça do Comercio. Both assassins were killed by the police, but the damage was done, and the writing was on the wall. The Portuguese monarchy was living on borrowed time. And that borrowed time ended 33 months later, when on October 5, 1910, the Republican Party proclaimed the establishment of the First Republic after three days of military rebellion. Now, it wasn't originally called the First Republic, but as we're about to see, the fracture of the Republican Party and spoils over the rise to power in a democratic system would directly lead to several coups and culminate in the Second Republic, the Estado Novo, in 1933. But before we get to that point, let's return to 1910. Almost immediately after seizing power, the Republicans took aim at the Catholic Church and religion in general. Equating the religious with monarchical support, the Republicans were determined to strip the church of any and all authority, as well as to expropriate church assets and property for usage by the state. In addition, many religious elements at the University of Coimbra were abolished, and Christian doctrine was suppressed in state institutions across the country. This harsh stance against religion would invigorate a young man from Vimiero, who would one day rise to crush the Republicans, liberals, socialists, and communists, under the structure of the Estado Novo. The First Republic's persecution of the Jesuits and the Catholic Church was so fierce that the United States, United Kingdom, and most other European states refused to initially recognize the new republic. After 16 years, 45 governments, yes, 45, a 25-day unrecognized restoration of the monarchy, several military coups, and mass corruption, the First Republic came to an end on May 28, 1926, when General Gomez de Costa led 15,000 troops into Lisbon, meeting no resistance but instead a claim from the people who were tired of the failures and instability of the Republican government. During the next two years, Portugal was ruled as part of the Ditadora Militar, or military dictatorship, 
until General Oscar Comorna was re-elected to the post of president in 1928, whereas it was then modified to the Dictadura Nacional, or National Dictatorship, until March 19, 1933, when the Estado Novo was implemented with the adoption of a new constitution. After decades of instability, economic stagnation, and educational failures, this new regime would establish political order, economic growth, and infrastructure expansion. Now it's here that we're going to halt the history of Portugal, as the details behind these events will be told both from the perspective of our main character, Antonio Salazar, and from the historical perspective, as I will take time in certain episodes to dig deeper into the other names and events occurring during our journey. Next time, we will begin with the early days of life for Antonio Salazar, as we follow him from his youth in Vimiero, through his days in the Vizu Seminary, and ultimate decision to pursue a degree in economics at the University of Coimbra, where he would experience a political awakening. His years at the prestigious university would lead to further opportunities for the young Salazar, as his fame and recognition as an academic and economist eventually opened the door to government. Until next time, this is Green Tea with D-Man.